Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out on this wonderful evening for what's going to be a wonderful program. My name is Artemis Kirk, University Librarian at Georgetown, and it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you and truthfully to see so many students in the audience. This program is a program of the Georgetown Library Associates, but it's tonight also being co-sponsored by the Georgetown Hoya. So thank you very, very much. We believe that the library is central to everything that goes on at Georgetown. Um, you were given a card this evening that gives you a sense of the resources that are going to be available to you through this library that will also link you to some of our subject experts in the library in case you would like to follow on with the topics that are going to be discussed this evening. We're very, very pleased to be able to make this available to you and very pleased especially to be hosting tonight's Ellen Catherine Gestalter Memorial Lecture. This program was established in memory of Ellen Catherine Gestalter, a 1998 graduate of Georgetown College. This was established by her family to honor Ellen's concern for social justice issues in the United States. Ellen joined Teach for America when she graduated from Georgetown, and she was assigned to a DC public school in Anacostia. Ellen remained at the school after her two-year commitment and planned to teach one or two more years, then go on to graduate school and reform either the educational system or the nutrition available to poor children, both causes of which, frankly, appalled her. Sadly, Ellen became ill in the fall of her third teaching year and was unable to continue. However, she obtained a professional chef certificate and was accepted into New York University master's degree, master's degree program in public health education at New York University. Unfortunately, she was unable to continue. She passed away in the year 2004. The Gestalter family's generosity has enabled us to continue Ellen's legacy by hosting thought-provoking speakers whose ideas and work provide insight and focus on significant social and economic issues in America. Tonight's program is an especially fitting one for our memorial lecture, for Ellen Gestalter shared many traits with Tracy McMillan. There are many similarities. Would you please join me in thanking the Gestalter family for doing this for Georgetown and for Ellen's memory? Won't you please stand, members of the family? So let me tell you a few of the similarities between Ellen Gestalter and Tracy McMillan before I introduce Tracy to you. The women, it turns out, were born just months apart and would have been the same age today. Both of them shared the same driving interest in food and nutrition for the poor. This became Ellen's cause after her years of teaching at the school in Anacostia. She was appalled at the school lunch nutrition program and she was very upset about the food available at home for her students. These are also Tracy's interests. Tracy graduated from New York University, which you know Ellen would have attended. And both have loved and appreciate cooking. Ellen earned a professional chef certificate from the Institute for Culinary Education during her periods of remission from the leukemia that ultimately took her life. And Tracy, of course, is deeply into food. The Gestalter family have said that they are convinced that if Ellen were here today, she and Tracy would have been best friends, a true compliment to both women and to their character. So now let me introduce you to our speaker, Tracy McMillan, who is an award-winning journalist and author of the New York Times bestseller, The American Way of Eating. Her book argues for thinking of fresh, healthy food as a public and social good a stance that inspired the New York Times to call her a voice the food world needs. The American Way of Eating was awarded the prestigious Sidney Hillman Prize <clears throat> excuse me, for book journalism and was a finalist for a Goodreads Reader's Choice Award. An International Association of Culinary Professionals Food Matters Award, an International Investigative Reporters and Editors Award, and a James Beard Journalism Award. Tracy McMillan won this journalism award for a feature on farm labor she wrote for the American Prospect. 
Tracy is currently the 2014 Keppel Journalism Fellow at Wesleyan University, where she teaches a course on writing about social inequality. She has also served in various jobs related to food, as you can see by the subtitles of her book. Tracy will be speaking on food and politics tonight, a subject that honors Ellen Gestalter's commitment to education and social justice. Please join me in welcoming Tracy McMillan. Okay, good evening, everybody. I'm so glad to see everybody came out despite it being, you know, warm outside. Um, so I'm very excited to be here. And of course, I want to thank everyone um, who helped make this possible. So that, you know, Artemis and the Library Associates, the folks at the Hoya, uh, Jennifer Smith and Annie Lorenzana, who have been really helping with a lot of the admin work. And as someone who has done a lot of admin work in her life, I'd like to do a shout out for that. And of course, um, Herb and Robbie Gestalter and their family um, who helped with everything else. Um, so I should say that while I give talks pretty frequently about my work and the things that I, you know, I'm sort of excited about, um, this one really is special to me because it's in memory of Ellen. Um, and as Artemis mentioned, you know, we had a few sort of interesting traits in common, um, you know, really basic things like age and gender. Um, but there are some other things that, you know, as I sort of talk with Herb and Robbie about Ellen, um, I, I've sort of found more striking. And from what you know, we had sort of talked about, I know that one of Ellen's passions as she finished college, right, was her teaching. And what really struck me about that is that, you know, when she went off to teach, she made a real professional home for herself in this school that she taught in Anacostia. And so while I didn't know Ellen personally, I feel pretty confident in saying that she must have had a bit of gumption, right? Because for a very nicely educated young white lady um, to go and make a home for herself in a place that is not mostly white, you know, that's kind of what it takes. And, and that's not really because it's all that difficult to go and do that. It's just that, you know, most white people don't ever have to go do that. And so learning to do it takes, you know, a bit of strength and courage and determination. And, you know, I really feel like, let me see. Okay. Um, you know, and that's something different. Um, a little bit from what I do, but not that much, because as a poverty reporter, that's sort of the root of my background. You know, I often find myself in places um, where, you know, it's not a mostly white space and having particularly to go and do work um, like I did for the American Way of Eating, right? It, it takes some time to learn to traverse those spaces. Um, you know, so sort of what Ellen did as a teacher, I sort of had to do um, to do the work in my book. Um, you know, but more than that, and this is more in line with what I'm gonna be talking about, um, you know, Ellen didn't just care about education and, and things that were sort of, could be a little abstract, but about concrete things, right, about food. And, you know, she saw the kinds of food that kids ate in their classroom or that were in the local grocery stores or at, you know, the school lunch program. And she understood on a basic level that that wasn't fair, right, that that set kids up to not succeed as much as they might otherwise. And that's also something I think that um, Ellen and I would have shared if we were friends, right? This interest and passion for the realities of life and not just the ideals and not just trying to make a difference, but trying to, to actually concretely want to do it. And so I, you know, I am always really honored and appreciative anytime anyone wants to let me talk about what I'm passionate about. Um, you know, I'm particularly honored this evening to be here. So this evening, I'm going to be talking with you about two of my primary obsessions. So that's food and class. Um, we're in a very interesting place when it comes to that topic lately. Um, a decade ago, and I can say this because I've been reporting on, on poverty probably for the last 10, 15 years, um, it was very difficult to get anyone to have a serious conversation about either of these two things. So food writing at that time in the US was still pretty much confined to gourmet, to gourmet and bon appetit. Um, you had had Fast Food Nation by Eric Schlosser, but there was still this idea that food writing was about fine French cuisine and maybe some very haughty chefs. It was all pretty much written as if the prerequisite for caring about food was to have been born into money. And even more generally, Americans didn't really want to talk about poverty very much. You know, welfare reform was about a decade old and we hadn't seen beggars flooding into the streets. And so we didn't really want to talk about economic inequality or wages very much. And even if we did talk about those two topics, 
Food and poverty didn't ever overlap. Food was something we talked about, but usually frivolously. And poverty was something that would be re a real bummer, and so we didn't really want to talk about that either. And they didn't mix. And you know, it's, it's interesting because particularly with the food stuff, like I had the opportunity yesterday um, to go by the Smithsonian's exhibit on food, right? With, it's got Julia's Child kitch, Julia Child's Kitchen, but all these other um, sort of setups. And it was really striking for me to see that, you know, while culturally it's an amazing accomplishment of documenting sort of what's happened uh, with American food, um, there was very little mention of the sort of concrete realities around economics and labor and systems that go into um, the American food system. And that's not to say they weren't, there wasn't any discussion at all. There were hints of it um, in that exhibit. But you had to know where to look for it. And so there was this section of that exhibit um, dealing with how Americans thought about food in the 1970s. And you know, so they had some things that were sort of very typical, like this would be something from the 1970s. So you have like a copy of the Moosewood Cookbook, right? Just like for those of you that don't know, this is like very good hippie fare um, from a very nice middle class white lady with a restaurant. And they have pictures of Alice Waters, who is also a very nice middle class lady with a restaurant. Um, but they had this other thing. They had this picture of a Black Panther breakfast program in California because the Black Panthers and also the Young Lords, which is a Puerto Rican nationalist group in New York City in the 60s and 70s, um, they set up free breakfasts for neighborhood kids long before USDA was doing you know, school breakfasts for kids. And you know, when those neighborhoods got those breakfast programs from these radical organizations, you know, they did not feed them junk food. They fed them healthy food because that was important to the people in those communities, even though you know, those were usually low-income communities. And in some ways, I think stories like that Black Panther Breakfast Program are really important to remember today because they get at a point that's central to our discussions about food and to the work I do today. Because they show us that pretty much everyone wants good food. Now, this is a strangely controversial topic, this idea that everybody wants good food. But I find myself coming back to it again and again because it's something that I see often in person and then often hear contradicted very often. And it's really what led me to write The American Way of Eating. So as Artemis talked about, um, The American Way of Eating was this sort of crazy book project that I embarked on um, about five years ago, almost to the day I left New York City in April of 2009 to start it. Um, and frankly, it's really only the last year or two that I've realized how completely crazy that project was. Um, so, but what I did, right, I went, I worked undercover in three jobs in the food system, and so what that means, and the sort of the expertise I have, is that I went and I worked as a farm worker in California, I worked in two Walmart supermarkets, and I worked in the kitchen of a New York City Applebee's. And so I took each job for two months, and the deal was I had to live and eat off my wages. And then I take that story, so I take that narrative, and I use that to engage in a broader discussion about food and class in America. So this is... Now I can say that was a little crazy, um, but I did it for a few different reasons, right? So part of the reason I went and I did that is I really wanted to have a conversation about how the food system we have now as it stands, not as it ideally would work, but as it now stands, how that works. And so that's why I went to Walmart instead of you know a nice little organic farm or a community supported agriculture project. And it's why I worked at an Applebee's um, instead of a local food type restaurant. I really wanted to understand the internal logic of the food system that we have now. And you know, there's another reason I did it that, the way that I did, which is that I really wanted to get inside the head of someone trying to eat and live at the bottom of the food system. And that is not easy reporting to do with another human because you have to get them to sort of pick apart their thought for you. So the sort of way to cheat it was for me to go and just do it and take good notes on myself. Um, and, and just sort of go and see and just be like, well, how well can I do with this project? And so those are the sort of intellectual and reporterly reasons that I wanted to go do it. Um, but there's a deeper and much more personal reason that I wanted to go do it too. And to be entirely honest, um, I was just getting really tired of hearing from very well-intentioned people that we should all just cook more and we should just spend some more money and that's how we're gonna fix the food system because that just seemed to be the wrong point to me to make about people's diets. You know, I come from a working class background. My dad sold lawnmowers, my mom was sick when I was a kid. You know, it wasn't a very fancy upbringing. Um, and I spent most of my work life, you know, reporting on families that were, you know, much poorer than what I grew up with. And most people I ran into seemed to already care about their meals. And my experience made me feel like, 
people didn't need better advice so much as they needed a raise and a better grocery store. And, you know, that was sort of my take on it, but I'm also a reporter, right? I'm like, well, I might just be angsty. So I haven't spent that much time figuring this out. So I'm just gonna go and do this project and figure it out and see what I can learn. And so I started in California. And I went there because I wanted to see how we grow healthy food, fruits and vegetables. Um, California's Central Valley alone is responsible for between a third and half of the fruits and vegetables we eat in the US. And so I tried, I started out in the Central Valley because that's really where all the fruits and vegetables come from. Um, but the truth is that it's very hot and dry there. Um, my experience was it was sort of like an irrigated desert with trees springing up from irrigation tape. Um, and at, the real reason I didn't stay other than it being dusty um, is after a week of working in 105 degree heat, I got heat sick, um, which means I spent an afternoon projectile vomiting um, and then dragging myself to the public library where I could sit in air conditioning for a while. And you know, this made it very concrete for me that the things that I'd been warned about um, from farm worker advocates, which is that people die every year from heat sickness, usually in the fields, um, that made that very concrete. And I didn't really like that I had to leave. Like I felt a little bit like I was giving up, but I decided that probably most farm workers, if they had the privileges I'd been born with, would leave where they were getting heat sick and go somewhere milder. Um, and so I moved. I went to the Salinas Valley where it was cooler. Um, and by the time I got there, right, I'd had a few weeks of work experience. I knew a little bit about how to get a job. Um, and I moved in with an indigenous migrant family. So they were renting a small house with a garage, and in turn, they rented out rooms to other farm workers. So the family, this main family, was about was five kids and two parents, and they shared one bedroom. And then there was another family, which was two parents, an infant, excuse me, and a toddler, and they were in another bedroom. And then five or six men lived in the garage and a little windowless shed built off the back called a casita. And then I rented a cubby off of the living room, which was fairly luxurious quarters because I had my own private space to myself. So that put about 16 of us sharing one house with a bathroom and a kitchen. And finding work meant I needed to find someone to help me find work. So one of the interesting things about farm labor is that much like my job as a reporter, it requires networking. Um, and so my landlady's cousin agreed to take me to the garlic fields. Um, and the work there was hard. So you kneel in the dirt and you spend the day cutting garlic as fast as you can with pruning shears. Um, so just the cheap things you get at Home Depot, right? Like they're $5. Um, some farm workers save up for better quality shears because you sort of want to reach an economy of scale and better shears, you know, don't dull as quickly. Um, and so I had no idea what I was doing right. Um, and the cousin taught me what he knew. So he showed me how you hold a bouquet of garlic, you know, in your hand and pull the bulbs really tight, right? So you sort of have this loosey-goosey bouquet and you sort of pull it tight so the bulbs are all right here. And then what you do is you steady that against your right thigh and you use the strength of your shoulder and your upper arm to sort of press down on the shear. So you're not really squeezing your hand, right? You're sort of more using your arm as a whole. And you just do that over and over again to take the roots off and then you snip it over a bucket. And, you know, that doesn't sound like it's super complicated, right? You're just like, oh, you just cut the stuff off, it'll be fine. But it was pretty demanding, and I paid for the price for it with my body. Like, my legs were bruised up every day until I stopped working. So it's just like these little shallow bruises. It's a little hard to see in the light here, but, like, it's whatever. It, it's not very fun. It doesn't hurt, but you're sort of doing this all the time. And other things happened with my body, too. So I worked my right arm so hard that I developed tendonitis, um, that was so intense I could not use my right arm. That's also because I'm stubborn, obviously. Um, but that injury, you know, that still bothers me now, right? I still have problems a little bit with my right arm from that. And it wasn't really until my body began to resist the work I was trying to do that I really appreciated how closely a farm worker's earnings are linked to their physical being. You know, so when I was working, I was only paid by piece. So for every five gallon bucket I filled, I earned $1.60. And because each bucket weighs about 25 pounds, that means for every pound of garlic I pick, so for every five or six heads, I think, or in a, you know, in a pound, I got about six cents. So when I worked at Walmart, we stocked garlic from the garlic company, uh, one of the companies for which I was picking, and we charged $3.38 a pound. So my wages in the field then at the store accounted for less than 2% of what shoppers were paying. 
So when growers are talking about how an increase in wages would make food unaffordable, I try to keep that in mind, right, that 2% number. So this is the tarjeta that I got. Um, I think this is, this is from like my second or third day, I think, my first, so on my first day in the fields, I picked 10 buckets of garlic. And you can kind of see here along at the bottom, those little punch outs, right? Those are sort of the buckets that I had picked for the day. Um, on my first day, I earned exactly what I'd picked. So that was 10 times $1.60 or $16. That was for an eight and a half hour day. Um, I got very formal paychecks, so all of, them came with Social Security deducted, and they were on company blue and white computerized forms, and they would say the hours that I worked. And in California, you have to pay minimum wage. That is required even if you're being paid by piece. So if you have workers that aren't being sort of productive enough to meet minimum wage, you've, as a company, you're supposed to make that up. But my company didn't do that. They just paid me the $16. And what they did is they changed the hours on my check. So they took the $16, they divided it by $8 minimum wage to two hours, and that's what my check said. The same way they did it for everybody else. Um, you know, I didn't make minimum wage, and really nobody that I was working with did. Um, I, obviously, I was a really bad farm worker, um, but even the strongest people, right, couldn't quite get up to minimum wage. I usually, by the time I got up, my, my best day was like 17 buckets. Um, so the stronger workers could do more like four buckets an hour, right, in an eight-hour day, um, and you need to pick five to make minimum wage. So before I went out and I did this reporting, I talked to a lot of people. I talked to growers to hear how they thought about their work and talked to farm advocates and farm worker advocates and I talked to lawyers and I talked to people from the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Labor, and what I heard from growers was, oh, you would never cheat growers or workers, sorry, you'd never cheat workers because the penalties are just too terrible and there's so much regulation. And what I heard from the farm worker advocates was, this happens all of the time. And so part of the reason I went to the fields was sort of to see like, what, where does reality actually line up, right? And in my head, I'm like, oh, I'll be somewhere in the middle. I'm sure the farm workers are exaggerating. I'm sure the, the farmers are exaggerating. Um, and on this one, like I really came out of it feeling like the farm workers are pretty much right. Um, so that was for me, a really interesting set of lessons because I learned a lot about how life works in the food system, right, for the folks at the very start of it. And that's a small slice of life. You know, farm workers for a very long time have been some of the most marginal people in our country, though, and I didn't want that to be the only story I had about food, right? Like, I didn't want to just sort of look on the margins. I wanted to come in and look closer at sort of where more sort of typical Americans live. Um, and I wanted to see how you know, workers at the heart of the economy worked, and so that's why I went to Applebee's. And the biggest reason, really, I went to Applebee's, and this is actually the Applebee's I worked at, um, is that it's the largest casual full-service restaurant chain in the U.S. and the world. And I thought I might learn something by going there about how America's food system really works. And the second reason I went there is that I didn't really want to write a book that assumed the only culture worth exploring was what you find in the big coastal cities like New York and DC and San Francisco. I wanted to be telling a story that the people I grew up with had some reason to read. And Applebee's has this very curious position in American culture where I would guess it's probably the one sit down restaurant that like every American more or less has been to, right? Like, the coastal people go to that when they're like road tripping, like people in the rest of the country and like the rural towns and stuff. It's one of the nicer restaurants that comes in. And I also sort of really like this idea that, you know, at the, particularly when I pitched this book, which was like 2006, 2007, 2000, I was working at 06 and 07 and pitched it in 08. And I like the, all these books about chefs and the life in the kitchen were coming out. So you have like Anthony Bourdain and like, Ooh, he's like the bad boy in the kitchen at this fancy restaurant. I really kind of like the idea of being like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go to Applebee's, how about that kitchen? <laughs> so I went and I got a job in the kitchen as an expediter and then I pleaded my way into the prep kitchen. So this was really interesting for me, right? So when you talk to restaurant work advocates, they'll say, oh, well, you know, it's always white people go to the front of the house and people who aren't white go to the back of the house. And I walked in and I really wanted to work in the back of the house and I had to argue to like not get a waitress job. And I basically, and I used this same line with um, the farm work where I was just like, I've got a lot of problems. I don't really want to deal with clients. You don't want me dealing with clients. 
and I just don't want to talk about it. So if I just work hard, can I please work in the field? Can I please just stay back away from the customers? Um, and this, and I, you know, I wasn't super grumpy about it because I also came up with like a, a sort of a way to make this lighter and easier, which was that my sister, Shana, had this brilliant idea, which is that I should just tell people I wanted to go to culinary school, right? And so I could say, oh, well, you know, the reason that I am adamant about working in produce at Walmart is I really want to learn produce because I want to work, I want to go to culinary school. I really want to work in a kitchen, even at an Applebee's, because I got to learn if I can deal with work in a kitchen which also right, connotes like I respect your workplace and I think it's special and important. Um, and I feel like the easiest way to explain what I learned at Applebee's is just to sort of talk with you guys about what the kitchen was actually like and not that in the Bourdain way where it's like, oh, it's hot and fast and loud and brash, you know, which it was, um, but what the food in it was like, right? So at Applebee's, there was a walk-in refrigerator and you know, I was reporting this before every smartphone had a camera, so I don't have good pictures, right, from the Applebee's days because I still had, like, a crappy Blackberry, although Blackberries had the best keyboards, I will say. Um, so at Applebee's, there was a walk-in refrigerator, maybe six by ten feet, um, for this restaurant that was doing, you know, tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars every week or month. I don't remember quite how much they did all the time. So its perimeter was lined with shelves, and out of all of that, there were only four kinds of produce that came in uncut. So it was iceberg lettuce, tomato, onion, and potatoes. So the first three, they come in whole because they have to be put on burgers, right, taken from a whole thing, right? A sliced tomato isn't going to last long enough to look good on the nice burger that you pay for at Applebee's. And the potatoes come in whole because they actually do use fresh potatoes to make their mashed potatoes. Um, I'm not sure you can say they're from scratch, though, because so they take the, they take the potatoes, they rinse them, they don't scrub them. And then they mash them by hand, so it's you know, this huge potato masher. And then they're mixed with something called garlic milk, which comes frozen in bags. Um, and each brick of garlic milk, you, know, you just thaw it out and mix it with the mashed potatoes. It's really delicious. I have no idea what's in it. Um, and there was other produce we served, right, but it would come in sort of cut up. So we would get broccoli, um, and that stuff would come in sort of pre-cut in these big pillowy bags. Um, and, you know, and I, because I was there reporting, right, I would try and figure out, like, oh, where is this from? And it would never say. I would be like, it's broccoli from the moon. I have no idea. Um, and, you know, to sort of prepare the broccoli to serve it, the prep kitchen would make a dressing, which was, you know, a powder that you would sort of whip up with, like, warm water and become sort of gelatinous. And then you toss the broccoli florets with the dressing. And then when we would do the mashed potatoes, right, both the broccoli and mashed potatoes would have to be portioned because that's how Applebee's keeps their costs in check. So they're very organized about this. And so part of the prep kitchen work, right, is that you sit there with this big vat of broccoli and this big vat of mashed potatoes and you have a scoop and a scale. And what you do is you put the proper six to eight, I think it was six ounces of broccoli and 10 ounces of mashed potatoes into a little plastic bag. And you sort of roll it up and seal it. And then what you do is you take trays of these and you put them on the line for the cooks. So there's like a cooler you know, with shelves and you put like a tray in there. And then whenever an order comes up with mashed potato or broccoli, the cook reaches down, takes it out of the cooler, puts it on a plate, puts it in the microwave, nukes it, takes it out, puts it on a plate still in the bag, and puts the plate in the, you know, the, the window waiting for the entree part to get finished. And then my job, as an expediter would be, okay, I've got to get like a chicken with a mash and brock and I take it out and right before it goes out onto the floor, I empty the bags, right? Because if you take the mashed potatoes or the broccoli and you just put it under the heat lamp without the plastic over it, it starts to crust over and it looks pretty gross pretty fast. So the way to keep it looking fresh and just out of the bin, right, is that you take it out, the, out of the bag on the plate right there. And th so this is like super efficient and this is like a really great way to keep costs in check. But in practice what it means is that diners are eating food that has been heated and reheated and cooled and reheated in plastic. And if it's busy, what happens is the cooks take big platters full of mashed potatoes and broccoli bags and put it in the microwave, nuke it for like five minutes straight and then just stick it under the heat lamp so they can just take them off without even having to reheat them. And what that means is the plastic degrades, and so as I'm squeezing bags out onto the plates, the plastic flakes out all over the food. And there's nothing you can do about it, because you can't really sit there and pick it off in the middle of rush, right? And it goes out, and it looks like it's fleur de sel. And you know, you're like, OK, I've got like this nice looking, like that is, that's what I would have thought if I was the Applebee's customer. I'd been like, oh, Applebee's is getting in on this artisan thing. 
Um, and so what I realized in this very concrete way is that Applebee's isn't really cooking, right? Like the cooks, and the cooks knew this too. They'd be like, yeah, we're just assembling things. And it occurred to me that this is sort of like Applebee's sort of hits the sweet spot between like Sandra Lee's semi-homemade cooking at McDonald's. And like most of the food we were serving there isn't really any different than what I can make at home in my freezer um, or out of my freezer, right? And this really got me thinking about what I'm getting when I'm paying for eating out. Because when I crunch the numbers, right, I'm a reporter, I, I'm an investigative reporter, so I love spreadsheets, right? So when I like, go and I crunch the numbers, the ingredients for like one of the small steak, steak dinners that we did came to like three fifty or four dollars to make for the ingredients, and we charged seventeen ninety nine for it, right? And so when you're talking, I mean, what that's like four, five, four to five times the cost of the raw ingredients. Like once I did that calculation, I was like, I'm not paying somebody four times as much money to like nuke something out of the freezer, right? And I never would have thought about that if I hadn't gone there and seen it, which is sort of why I do what I do. And that's also, right, the reason that I had to go and actually work at Walmart, because people talk a lot about, oh, Walmart's so lame. But I needed to go see it. It's a very interesting company. If any of you are following this wonderful series that Marketplace is doing this week on Walmart and food stamps, um, if you haven't been, you should really go check it out, because it's amazing. And the only problem I have with it is that it's not mine. Um, <laughs> But so at Walmart, right, I went and I worked for two months and worked in two different uh, Walmarts. One, I worked in produce outside of Detroit. And so this is a picture of a stock room behind the produce room I worked at. Um, and all of these crates, all these black plastic crates, so these are RPCs, these are like returnable plastic crates, um, were full of food that was too rotten to be sold, or at least too ugly to be sold. Um, and the deal was is that at Walmart we had to do returns, which means inventory it so the store knows what it's throwing away. And most of us had actually not been trained to do returns. So what would happen is you would just end up with cart after cart after cart full of these crates of rotten food in the back. So the reason this isn't a stock room is because all the empty space in the produce room was already full. So if I remember correctly, there were about 20 crates worth of rotting food like on the night that I was working here. And the real thing that I learned there in the Walmart near Detroit was sort of that well, I cannot apply this, obviously, to the company, which is a behemoth, like, as a whole. In that particular store, its efficiency was a myth, particularly as far as the produce section was concerned. So, like, one day, I threw out 200 pounds of asparagus, which was because it had been left to rot in the cooler and nobody had rotated it out. So this was, like, mid-June, and the boxes were, I had boxes that were dated back to, like, the start of May. Um, and that was mostly just because... My manager hadn't been trained, and he was like a 20-year-old kid who didn't really know anything about food, and he just sort of was like, okay, well, it looks fine, like, whatever, and we ended up with, like, sort of massive amounts of food waste in that department. And so that part was sort of interesting, but for me, what was really, was more fascinating was when I spent time in Kalamazoo. So this was, I, I was doing winter reporting, so I was on, I was in the baking aisle, in November in Michigan during winter on the night shift. And that's where I sort of feel like I got a sense of some of the more deeper and universal truths about how people relate to food. You know, because I get asked a lot about which job was the worst when I was doing this work, and most people assume it's going to be the farm work, and it's totally true that physically the farm work was the most demanding, but Walmart was the one I liked the least, and that has as much to do with who I am, actually, as with the job itself. So one of the lessons I learned in, the, in this Walmart outside of Kalamazoo was just how not fun cooking can be, because I usually really love cooking. I find it really enjoyable and sort of therapeutic and really interesting, um, but it's really only fun when it's something you are choosing rather than something you have to do. And for most middle class families, right, cooking's still something that you know, like we're choosing to do. We have enough money to, to eat out if we really want to. And if you really just can't deal with the dishes tonight, okay, well fine, we'll, we'll go and spend the 50 bucks for dinner. Um, you can or order pizza in or whatever. But when you're living on seven or eight dollars an hour, that choice pretty much disappears. And so I got to learn this in Kalamazoo because I basically screwed up my own budget. Um, I, one thing I got to learn is that I'm not a good budgeter so much as I am someone with a savings account. Um, so I ended up completely unexpectedly without enough money for my rent. 
Um, and part of the problem, funnily, was that I had done this really intelligent middle class thing of going and buying a bunch of stuff in bulk because it would get me better prices, but it meant that I spent a bunch of money up front um, and then didn't have any money. So I've, I felt really great about my decision of doing this. And I went and bought like oats and flour and rice and I was like, look at me, I'm getting like cheap stuff of good quality, like I'm such a good little shopper. And then um, I didn't realize that because I worked on the night shift, like my Friday night paycheck would be split in two, right? Because at midnight, my pay period ended. So I worked from 10 to 2 to 12. I would get $14 or whatever I was getting for that. But the next six and a half hours, that would be on the next paycheck, which is about 50 bucks. And suddenly I realized I had all of my money tied up in grain futures in my pantry. <laughs> and... And I mean, I had never been in this situation before where there was, I mean, there was no wiggle room. There was no 45 cents to spend on a can of soda from the break room. Like if I was going to eat, it was raw flour and raw carrots or I was going to cook. And all of a sudden it became much less fun. You know, and I didn't, you know, and I felt really resentful. Like I was like, I don't want to stay in the house and cook beans. I want to go outside and do something. Um, and I really gained a new sympathy for parents who say they don't like cooking because for them it's not much of a choice either. I feel like I also gained sympathies for families who say they don't have time to cook. Because even though I wasn't, I wasn't even quite working full time, I was exhausted all the time, right? And that was just me. Like, I don't have kids or a partner or anybody I had to, like, take care of or deal with. I just had to go work the night shift. I was tired all the time. And it really got me thinking, because, you know, today, most people who are food insecure, which is sort of how the USDA measures hunger in America, um, about 60% of the people in the U.S. today that are food insecure are, have a full-time worker in the house, right? And if you're working full-time, it makes it harder to cook from scratch. And that means it's harder to eat healthfully and cheaply. And the more time I spent in Kalamazoo, the more time I came to understand that eating healthfully when you're poor is sort of like a zero-sum game. So like poor families don't have the money to eat well easily. Because if you have a lot of disposable income, you can eat like nice food without having to cook it yourself. Um, but they don't really have the time to eat well cheaply. So they just end up eating poorly and cheaply. And it's not usually, I'm sure sometimes this is true, but it's not usually that these families don't care about how they're eating. It's just that the entire system, and from this I mean like our work lives and our food prices and all these things, it just makes it hard to do anything else. And you know, to close out, I just want to talk a little bit about the lesson I learned in Kalamazoo that has sort of stuck with me the most. And that has a lot less to do with food than with the changes I've seen in my lifetime so far. So when I worked on the night shift, there was this woman who helped train me that I think I call her Carrie in the book. Um, she's a single mom of four, and she lived with her parents. And she was a teeny tiny woman. She was maybe like two-thirds of my size. Um, so she was so small that one of the women there called her tater tot. And on my first night working, Carrie, who was training me, like we set out during break. It was four in the morning, and we're sort of perched on the curb alongside the shopping carts at Walmart. And we're looking out over this vast plain of the parking lot at the Meyer across the road. Walmart often um, puts itself across the street from competitors, um, which Meyer is one. And she totally scared the crap out of me because she started talking about unions, and I was like, oh my God, she's on to me. She must know that I'm a journalist. Oddly enough, it is not usually people's first thought that you might be a journalist when you're working at Walmart. <laughs> you know, but Carrie and I kept talking, and she said her problem with unions, like they had at Meyer, because Meyer's a union shop, was that they took money out of her check. And she didn't see the point in going to work there when the pay, you know, so far as she knew, wasn't that much higher. And her wages did go up every year at Walmart, so after seven years, um, she was making about $11 an hour. And that was more than she could say for waitressing, um, and, right, which is true. Like the tipped minimum wage hasn't gone up um, at least since I was waitressing 20 years ago, right? Still 2 13 an hour. Um, and that was sort of the other job she'd had. And you know, she had finished high school, but she, you know, I think she'd gotten pregnant pretty young. And so that had sort of been the end of school for her. And besides, you know, she was like, and it's not so bad. You know, after 15 years at Walmart, I'll get my, my discount card for life. Right, and be able to come and shop at a lower price at Walmart all the time. And so because of that discount card, and the brilliant folks at Marketplace just crunched numbers on this, but you know, she did all of her shopping and got all of her groceries at Walmart because of that. And that really made me pause because I knew, of course, that manufacturing jobs 
had sort of left and that prospects were different for people than they had been, you know, when my grandfather was raising a family of five on one factory worker's salary. And I knew, of course, that options were limited for people without more than a high school diploma. But I hadn't thought through what that really meant for people's lives. And until, really until I heard Carrie talk in these glowing terms about the discount card, it hadn't occurred to me that for her, Walmart was the best option, right? She needed a job, and Walmart was the most stable game in town, and that's why she was there. Not because she loved Walmart or thought it was cooler or hipper or, you know, she wanted to be there exactly. She just needed a job, and it could offer one, and it wasn't going anywhere, unlike, you know, the manufacturing jobs had. And I didn't feel like I could fault her for that, right? That's what made sense for her. And sort of what I, I've come to sort of feel like is that this parallels is the situation most Americans find themselves in when it comes to food. You know, Walmart and the kind of food it sells is the biggest, most stable game in town. And I spent a lot of time talking about how and why it's so terrible for people to decide to shop there and how we want for people to make better individual decisions. And I hear this a lot. You know, I spend a lot of time actually in sort of the food world space and the foodie space. And I hear this a lot from people um, who've started conversations about local food. And I feel like... Alice Waters is one of the people that just drives me up a tree all the time because she compares the choice to eat healthfully to the choice to buy shoes. And to be really blunt about it, I, I feel like this is what's sort of shaping up to be one of the central questions of our time because when we're talking about food as if it's a shoe, like, is that really what we want? Like, are we cool with the idea that we're going to be thinking about food as if it's a lifestyle luxury product and not like a basic component to life? Now, this isn't really just a food for thought question, right? Like, I'm not asking you because I think it's entertaining. I'm asking you because it's a very real and hard question. And the way that we answer it as a nation, it's going to have very serious repercussions. You know, last, I think it was last year, right, we got some news that like obesity has been going down. Actually, this year we got some more good news about that. And that's great and reflects, you know, I think a lot of the work that we're seeing, like, from the Obama administration and folks around, like, the Let's Move campaign also reflects a lot of grassroots work that's been going on for the last 10 and 15 years outside of that context. Um, and I'd say that, you know, usually the people that have been driving that work are people who don't think about food as if it's sneakers, right? And so despite, like, those drops in obesity, right, today, like, two-thirds of the adults, most of the drops have been with kids, right, are still overweight or obese. And when one in three kids born in 2000, which I've got to find a new stat because that is getting old now, um, or it's, right, one in three kids born in 2000 were expected to develop type 2 diabetes, um, and diet-related disease has been on track to sort of outpace tobacco as the number one killer. Like, is this really the way we should think about healthy food, right? That it's a fancy thing to just go buy? Because I increasingly feel like that's not really working for us, right? Healthy food is necessary for life. And in that respect, it's like water. And we currently, or like at least have not yet, accepted as a country or society that access to clean water in your home should be a privilege. We don't say, well, poor people can just drink the dirty water, and if they care about it, they'll pay more money for it, right? Like, we spend a lot of time and energy and money making sure everyone has access that is affordable and convenient to fresh potable water because it's necessary to life. And the question that I now really engage with is like why we don't do that to food. And that for me is sort of the final point that I wanna make before we break into Q&A, which I promise will be more fun than this, um, which is that having a frank conversation about food can be and increasingly is key to shifting our political discourse. You know, and journalists like our jobs now because we're increasingly freelance and have to build things like personal brands, which are noxious. Um, like we have to sort of walk around being like, look at how awesome my work is and it's doing really well. Um, but something that's been really amazing to me is that the conversation I started with this book has actually gotten legs to it, right? So a few weeks after the book came out, um, I had the pleasure of Rush Limbaugh attacking it for like 40 minutes or something on his radio program. And I, I should say, like, I grew up in a part of the country where we watched his television show in my high school for current events, right? So I'm, <laughs> I'm familiar with the rhetoric and work done by folks like Rush Limbaugh and, and sort of folks more on the conservative right. And the thing is, is like, that guy wasn't picking on me because I had a bad idea, right? He picked on me because it was a good idea, right? That it's powerful to talk about food as a right. And last summer, I also was really, I 
think it was less, it might have been 2012 at this point, but um, no, it was 2013, um, when the Farm Bill discussion was really ramping up on the Hill, Congressional Quarterly um, integrated my work into the introduction of their report on that topic. So when Congressional Quarterly, right, is saying like, here's how you need to think about the Farm Bill legislators, they used my work to ground and frame what they were talking about. So the fact that this idea is getting attention from all quarters, like that's an indication that this is actually powerful. And the idea that fresh and healthy food is not a luxury product, that's powerful. And my thinking is that we don't need to convince people to buy good food so much as we need to make it affordable and accessible. And in very broad terms, right, that just means we need to think about healthy food as more of a social good and a human right. So I just wanna leave you with this quick question um, is, which is that, you know, if we accept this idea that we have a public and social responsibility, well, it's probably not that quick, actually, but if we have, if we have this idea, right, that we have a public and social responsibility to build a food system, and really that means a political and economic system, and certainly at the very least, like, a wage system that provides us all with healthy food, like, what else might we start asking for? So that is all I have to say to you now, but we have Mike set up um, there and there, and I would really love to have a conversation. Yeah. Just make this go away. Come on down. Yeah, come on down. Um, so I know there's a lot of work going on at the grassroots level and at the state level on how to resolve some of these issues and, and working with communities on how to improve food security and bringing grocery stores to food deserts and things like that. Um, what would you say at the federal level would be the best policies to enact to sort of resolve some of these issues, whether it's reforming um, the crops that we subsidize or food stamps programs or um, you know, what other policies have you come across that you think could really make an impact on these issues? Right, oh, so how would I fix things? Ooh. Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, one thing, obviously, that, I mean, the, and the administration is doing this right now. They have the Healthy Food Financing Initiative, which is a program that funnels money into supermarket development projects in different areas. And there is some interesting social science coming out, right, that sort of is like, the way it gets framed is always, food deserts don't exist, or food deserts don't matter about obesity, rather than what is usually in the report, which is like, it's a really complicated question to determine exactly why people eat the way that they do. Um, so I would say you definitely want, I think that having support for putting supermarkets in neighborhoods that don't really have them, I think that's important. Um, I don't know that you can draw a direct line from OB, like not having the supermarket to having this, because to, right, it's not like the reason people um, have obesity and poor health are because there's no supermarkets, right? Like it's a much more complicated question than that. And it has as much to do with like the quality of food that's available in communities. So you've got to start having a conversation about sort of the balance of food that's on offer because it's much more, I think, that it's just so much easier to eat crap than it is to eat well, right? And that's really, I think, the supermarket thing is sort of a shorthand for that because, of course, it's harder to eat well if you don't have a supermarket. But, like, the supermarket's full of a lot of crap, too, right? And then if you've got a ton of really cheap, convenient, fast food type stuff that people can grab. And actually, right, there's interesting research showing that, like, actually middle class people are the ones eating the fast food. But, you know, if, you, if what's cheap and easy is crappy food, people are going to eat that, right? So... I think you've got to start having a conversation, obviously, about just sort of the quality of the food supply, right? And then that gets you into this thorny thicket of like the subsidies and all of that stuff, right? So I would say definitely you want support for healthy food grocery stores, accepting SNAP at alternative vendors like farmers markets and things like that so people can use it if they want to. Um, I would also say, like I'm just up finishing up a piece from Mother Jones right now about um, the USDA doesn't currently release sales data for specific stores or retailers. Um, and so that makes it really hard to sort of say, oh, what's happening in this specific neighborhood at these three stores? Like, if there's one green grocer and two other little stores and they're all in the same category, all you know is like those three stores had X amount in sales. But if you could sort of show like, well, most of the SNAP sales are actually at the green grocer, right? Then that would make it easier. So having access to better data, I think, would be great too. Thank you. And you can email me with more questions if you need a bigger plan. Thanks. <laughs> 
Hi, uh, my question is gonna be similar to hers in terms of kind of what would you do, um, but perhaps from a slightly different bent. So I've been a starving entrepreneur for a few years now doing something I think similar to what you were doing where I own a small business, I'm working some side jobs, they don't pay a lot. So between all the work that I do and then cooking, partially because of the volume that I eat, um, partially because I wanna eat good food and healthy food, and then partially just to keep my cost of living down because I don't make a lot. Um, I've noticed that, you know, it does keep me busy. Um, and so, you know, kind of things that you were saying uh, rang true. Um, one thing that I've been paying attention to a lot in the last few years has been artificial ingredients in my food. And that's been a big thing that I've tried to get rid of. So, you know, just sticking to anything that's fresh, anything that will rot. Um, and then from talking to other people, whether it's other people kind of at these side jobs that are also not making a lot and who, unlike me, may have children um, and that sort of thing, you know, when I talk to them about food occasionally, they'll talk about price a lot and they'll just get the cheapest stuff, you know, that's in a package and if you look at the ingredient label, it's got just all kinds of chemicals in there, which I presume get used because they're such a cheaper alternative to actually using like real food. Um, and like my girlfriend, she's Italian, and she was saying how- like, I don't mean to interrupt, but could, do you have a question? Yeah, okay, sorry. So like <laughs> in the EU, um, I understand that there are certain ingredients that are banned um, that are allowed here in the US. W what do you think about just kind of like, if we were to get rid of artificial ingredients, what would that do? Because one, I think that it could kind of increase the, the healthiness of all the food, but then it would also increase the cost. And then potentially you could just kind of like make food unaffordable for a lot of people. Right, so I mean, that's a very complicated food economics question. So one thing that's interesting, right, is that a lot of the reason that processed food tends not to be very good for us is the preservatives in it, right? And that's sort of key to the way the American food economy works right now, is that supermarkets rely on having shelf-stable food that's not going to go bad. And certainly bodegas and things like that, like smaller vendors, that's sort of the, the economics require stuff that can be stockpiled in a warehouse and then sold off as it's, a bit, you know, as it gets, as people come in and want it. And so I don't really know how to fix that. Um, I do know, like, there is, one thing that's interesting, right, is sort of paying attention to um, the expansion of Whole Foods because they, they're sort of doing this thing where they, they sort of have their own rogue, like, food quality rules, right? So all of the stuff that they have in their store, they don't let, and I haven't gone through and, and sort of looked through the regulations for their store, so they may have some things, but like their, their spiel is like, we don't have artificial colors or flavors or preservatives, and they don't let X, Y, and Z into their food. And you sort of see people being willing to go there and spend more money on, I think their grocery items are around five, 6% more than like a regular store's grocery items, like all the dry, dry goods stuff in the center of the store. Um, Five, six percent, right? They seem to do an all right business. They're um, planning on tripling their store count um, by 2020. So, like, I think that it's interesting because there is a real drive for that, I think, among American consumers in one way. I, the other thing, right, is that just when you're really poor, what happens, I think, is you just sort of shut off about what the other options are because you're just like, I do not have time to think about that or worry about that. Like, I can't, for a lot of people, that's just like, I'm sure it is totally worth that slightly higher price, but I don't have the money f to spend on it being worth it, right? So then, Thanks. alternatively, are you basically... Right. I don't... I'm happy to talk to you after, but I want to sort of sure. give room to everybody. But please do come down after. This side? Here in D.C., we've gone from one extreme of having all these food deserts where there was not much access to any quality food to having Whole Foods and Trader Joe's all over the place. But... From a financial perspective, for a lot of people, they're there, but they might not be accessible because of the cost, et cetera. And now in D.C., for the first time, we have Walmart. And I just thought from your perspective of having worked there, you do walk into a Walmart supermarket, and they have produce, and it's reasonably priced. And, you know, we in the city kind of felt that, that it was not a good thing to have this type of merchant come in, but at the same time it makes things more accessible. So I didn't know from your perspective of having worked in that environment, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it kind of neutral to have these come in um, to areas which might have limited other access? 
to right. good food. Yeah, that's a great question. And Walmart actually, right, is a huge partner in the Let's Move campaign and the healthy food financing stuff, like to sort of be, I mean, I think they're supposed to add 300 stores in food deserts around the country. So like my engagement with Walmart is like not aesthetic. I'm sort of like, I don't really care about it being a big box retailer or whatever. I will say, in my experience, and not just at that, the Walmart I worked at where the produce section was run terribly, it's not very good quality produce, although it's affordable. And so, and actually Consumer Reports just did like a ranking of grocery stores and everybody was just like, Walmart's produce is terrible. It was like number 20 on the list. Um, so I think access is important and I don't really care who's providing that access. I think it should be good quality. And you, I do think it's important, right, to have a discussion about what's the net effect for a store in a neighborhood. Because, I mean, Walmart, they've documented this, right? Like, Walmart comes into a community, wages go down all over. That's not good for people's health either, right? So you've got to, I don't think that you're like, oh, great, Walmart will fix the food thing and screw everybody's wages up. Like, that's not a good thing. I mean, I don't know how you, in, make sure that you have a political debate that's that nuanced and you can sort of balance it out like that. But I, I didn't realize the Walmarts had already opened here. I'll have to go visit one. Yeah, there, there's one by Union Station if you go. Oh, oh. I, I will be visiting Union Station. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, so my question is sort of about alternative agri-food systems and thinking, going back to education and thinking about how one of the big topics in food inequality and food justice is the federal free lunch program. And just because of, you know, who accesses it, people who already live in food, in food deserts, things like that. So I'm wondering how you feel about efforts like, for example, in California where I'm from, we have a lot of farm to school programs, which are awesome because they bring like healthy food into school lunches and but at the same time like these systems are by, by their very nature like rooted in you know privilege and class and race and who gets to access them whose parents have time to work at these schools mm -hmm. so I'm just and to push for these efforts and who have time to like you know go out of their day to do that so I'm wondering just how you feel about that and how you see that in the larger context of like sort of grassroots level food justice work. Right. Well, I mean, a lot of the farm to school stuff, right, has actually been spearheaded often with an eye towards getting just better quality food into schools and using it as like a farmer economic development tool, like that sort of, I think that's what's really interesting about the farm to school stuff isn't so much like, yay, we get fresher vegetables into school. I mean, that's awesome. I'm totally down with that. But what's really interesting is it builds a scalable marketplace for people who are sort of growing good quality food. So I know in like New York State, like there's been a, that's been a lot of the focus of bringing in the farm to school stuff. I do think it's problematic, right? If you start being like, oh, this is just something that you can have. I think the way that it should work is it should just be a policy, and the district puts money into it across the board if that's what they've decided is important. Not that it should be like an add-on that you get, like if you're in a wealthy district with parents who have the resources to do that. Like, yeah. I'm all about like it should just be for everybody if we think it's that important and. One thing, right, is it is useful to have, you know, middle class parents advocating for that to the extent that it draws attention to it and then can show that there's a market for it and then sometimes you can get broader system change. Like Sandra Singh Lowe actually has this like wonderful essay about being a public school parent. So she's a middle class writer for a columnist for the Atlantic, writing about like you need people like me in the public schools because we have the resources and then we can all share them and like we can sort of like if you have a mixed income school, right, the benefits trickle out to every kid, right, if a middle class parent can sort of, you know, do the agitating and then just, you know, bring in the other parents when they can. So, I mean, it's a complicated question you're asking. I'm down yeah. with farm to school. I think that, particularly in terms of bringing it into the cafeteria, that should just be a policy that gets decided. The stuff about, like, oh, kids learn about gardens and stuff, like, that's all really awesome. Like. You know, I grew up in rural Michigan, and we did stuff like that back in, like, the 80s. So, I mean, like, I went to, like, a pioneer camp, like, as part of school, and we, like, churned butter and all that. And that has totally stuck with me. I think it's awesome. So, yeah, I think that stuff can be powerful, too. Hi, um, I'm kind of coming from the workers' perspective. I'm also from Michigan, and so I probably, like, like I'm from outside Detroit, so I probably shopped at your Walmart. Um, <laughs> I've worked mostly in the food industry. I've worked at McDonald's, I've worked in a dining hall, and I worked in a restaurant. And I sort of have two questions for you. 
Um, one of them is kind of about the dependency you mentioned, like Walmart, they like subsidize their workers' groceries and so they can buy things. And McDonald's did the same thing too, where it was a lot of lower income um, people and like they would get like reduced McDonald's food. Mm -hmm. And you're totally right about them putting white people in the front. Like I asked to go in the back and they said no. <laughs> and it was really weird because it was in Detroit, which is a mostly Hispanic and African American city. And they still put the Caucasians in the front. But so... I, it's sort of like a dense question, but I was wondering if you thought like um, increasing the minimum wage or what's your thoughts on that? And then my second question was sort of the social aspect of this, where um, you're, you're talking about like food as a right, but um, there's like a prevailing attitude in this country where like if you're poor, you don't necessarily deserve to have all the things rich people have. Like I remember sitting, I was like cleaning a table and the owner of the franchise was next to me speaking to an accountant. And they were like legitimately in front of people like trying to cut down on benefits. Like they turned around and told me like, you're working full time and you need to stop because we don't want to pay you healthcare. So like, I'm wondering how is, and like customers would like tell you to your face like you're stupid and you're poor. And which was weird to me. But I was wondering how to fix like the social aspect of it. Like you mentioned like talking about food is a right, but what is an actual step that can be taken? Yes, yeah, I'm the journalist. I just get to say what I think all the time. But okay, so the first question, minimum wage, yeah, it should go up. Like, <laughs> I don't know what else to say about that. I mean, what's interesting to me is that we have this conversation about minimum wage and it gets talked about as like, it's this cost, it's this cost, it's hard for business. I'm like, who do you think is going to buy your stuff, right? Like, I mean, this is the thing that I'm really confused by is I'm like, so one of the, I feel like one of the defining lessons I got growing up is like Henry Ford did this awesome thing and he paid his workers enough that they could buy his cars and then you saw like this huge prosperity. I don't know, I'm not an economic historian so like you should not be like, well Tracy, like this other thing was going on and that's totally possible. But I'm like, okay, workers got paid enough to buy the stuff, the economy did well, they bought the stuff, right? And so now like we don't pay workers enough to like I mean, even survive, let alone like buy nice food or nice stuff. I mean, one thing that's been really cool to see is in the last like year or so, like I used to have this really fun talking point where I was like, yeah, it's like if the foodies really gave a crap about workers, they'd stop talking about food for a second and talk about a minimum wage so that people could actually buy the nice food. And now Michael Pollan says that we should have a higher minimum wage, which is super exciting. Um, in terms of the sort of cultural and social thing where like, people just sort of, we denigrate the poor. Like, I don't know how to fix that other than like try, like being, I have found that for me, like being open about the fact that I'm from a working class background, like shifts things a lot. Not always in the right way. Like sometimes I share this and then it backfires, right? When I'm in sort of elite circles with people that I haven't properly vetted and I'm like, oh, you just, oh, oh, I just screwed up. Like you're not, now you're not comfortable around me. <laughs> um, but I do think that there's some element to which Traditionally, the way that class mobility has happened is that people sort of are like, oh, I got over, I'm all done, instead of still being like, no, I went through this thing and this was hard and like we need to have some degree of empathy and also just being practical. But like it's just not good to have large chunks of the population disenfranchised and feeling, you know, resentful and maybe ultimately angry and maybe like, I don't know, throwing bricks and things. Like there are reasons, right, historically that we try to make it not so bad for poor people. Um, and so I, I back that. But other than just being like, try to be a good person, like a, I don't know how to fix it. Thank you. And calling people out on it too. Like I think that in a judicious and friendly way. Um. <laughs> um, I think a lot about trying to eat more organic food and look more local food, but I always wonder what it is like on the other side. Like are the farmers still working in the same conditions? Is it the same sort of back-end um, supply system. So I'm wondering if you had any experience sure. with that. That's a really good question, yeah. So I was really shocked when I was doing um, the farm work to figure out that um, organic fields are often directly adjacent to the regular fields. So I mean, they're literally separated by like a dirt road at the same level. And you're, I was like, oh, huh, that's interesting. And so the main th difference for workers in an organic field is just that you will not get sprayed accidentally with synthetically derived chemicals, right? So you could get sprayed accidentally with organically derived chemicals. Um, so that was also something interesting. Like, you know, I was working in a field and you, if you 
if you're an investigative reporter, you can go to like the county agricultural office and be like, okay, I saw this helicopter spraying some stuff at this hour on this day, and I think it was this field that I found on the county agricultural map, and they can tell you what it was, and they can tell you what the field was. And so I was all like, oh, they were spraying next to us, I'm gonna figure out what it was, and it was an organic field next to us. It was like organic spinach getting sprayed with whatever it is that organic spinach gets sprayed with. And I was like, shocker, that was like, Right, Tracy, I'm like, organic doesn't mean that there's no pesticides at all used. It just means that they're not falling under these certain kinds of things. Um, in terms of worker conditions, it's t the only difference is that is like less chemical exposure than you're gonna see in a regular field. The wages are not higher. So when I started out in the Central Valley, I did a few days in grapes and sort of befriended this woman who was my forewoman. And she, there wasn't any work, so she took me out with her to sell food to workers. So she would get up at like three in the morning and make like burritos and tacos and like a big thing of, of avena, which is like a really, really liquidy oatmeal. And we would go and sell it at like 5.30 in the morning when the sun was coming up to onion workers who work through the night. And so we'd go to this onion field and we're like trundling through with her truck, or not trundling, like we're in, the tr in her little pickup truck calling out about selling it. And I, I noticed that like the whole field, right, is these huge bags that say Cal Organic Onions, right? So I was like, oh, it's an organic field. So like when we finally like stop and we're selling to some workers and the guys come up and fun. So my, my friend, right, is this indigenous woman. So she's like this tall, pretty darkly complected, clearly like an indigenous Mexican woman. And they asked her if I was her sister. And they were like, oh, is this your sister or daughter? Something where I was like, that is optimistic. Um, and then we were like talking with them and I was sort of like, okay, now that we've got a rapport, I was like, and this is all in my bad Spanish. I was like, so these are organic fields. They're like, huh? I'm like, it's organic. There's no chemicals. And they were like, okay. I was like, so is it better? And they're like, it's the same job. It's a dollar a bag. Like, that's what we get. We get a dollar for like this big sack of onions. That's it. So, you know, I think it, organic can be, is great for, to the extent that, you know, it doesn't get sort of perverted through the legislation process and whatever. Like it's great to have fewer chemicals on foods and have stuff cleaner and certainly to worry about it from a worker perspective because that's really who pays for our use of organic chemicals, right? It's not so much at the consumer end. It's the folks that are living in those communities where it's in the dust, it's on their clothes, they take it home, their children breathe it. Um, that's all a problem, but you know, it's not a huge difference for workers. Yes, a quick comment. Uh, this will be the last one. Oh, great. A quick comment and then a question. Um, one thing I've noticed at Whole Foods, increasingly they are producing two categories of produce, conventional mm -hmm. and organic. And it's very interesting because um, sometimes the price is about the same. So I don't know what's going on there, but um, I'd be curious to know if you've observed whether people make a distinction when they shop in a place like Whole Foods. And also the main question um, I have is, you, I've noticed you haven't mentioned anything about farmers markets. And I'm wondering if there's a sociological stratification there, or in other words, do middle class people take to farmer's markets, or have you seen that it is very attractive to people across, you know, cross span? Okay, good, yeah, those are good questions. So the Whole Foods thing, I actually have done a bunch of reporting on Whole Foods. Um, they have announced in the last, like, six months, I think it was their last quarterly earnings report, they announced, like, yeah, we're, we're increasing our selection of conventional, uh, high-grade conventional is what they call it. Um, so they're definitely bringing more conventional produce into their stores. That's a change that's happened within the last six months to a year. Um, that is because they are absolutely aiming for more of a mixed income marketing strategy, right? Because they're expanding from, I think they were at like 330 stores last year, and they're going to get up to 1,200. They're trying to do by t t up to 1,200 within, you know, in less than 10 years. And that means they've got to be able to bring in, a, like, they've got to go down the income ladder a little bit. Um, so that's what they're doing there. They also try to do a lot of education, right, and sort of in terms of being like, no, you really want to eat like in this way, and it's v it's very sophisticated. So they have nutritionists, like the Detroit store where I've done a lot of reporting, has a nutritionist on staff who is at the store and like runs classes, and like she has this whole talk that she does at you know black churches all over the city. She's a very much in demand person, and it 
it exactly parallels the health starts here thing that John Mackey got into the stores about the four pillars of healthy. Like it's really savvy marketing. So they're bringing that stuff in, I think because they're trying to, they really hate the whole paycheck thing. Like if you would like to like get a Whole Foods executive upset with you, I suggest you call it Whole Paycheck. My husband does. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know they want to get rid of that. They see that as a stigma. And so I think bringing in conventional produce means that at least when it's in season, it probably won't be that much higher price point because right now, the reason that Whole Foods is more expensive to shop at is really just because of the produce and the meat. Like their, um, their dairy's fairly competitive. Their dairy and eggs are, well their eggs are still pricey, but like dairy's fairly competitive. That grocery stuff really is five, six percent more if you're doing the 365 brand on the grocery staples that they have. So the only places they have left to, where they need to bring the price down to be more competitive are produce and meat. And then in terms of farmer's markets, I mean, I see a lot of demand for that across all incomes. So I mean, I've done a, quite a bit of reporting in Detroit and there, I mean, like I've met like Kmart cashiers coming in with like their snap card because during growing season, there's a, t a two for one match up to $20 a week. So you go in with 20 bucks on your snap card and they will give you another $20 for fresh produce. Um, so she like drove in like 14 miles, right? To just come and get that extra $20 thing for produce. So you see it all across income. What makes it difficult, I think, for lower income folks to patronize farmer's markets is just scheduling, right? Because Farmers markets, I mean, it's just usually the one day a week thing, right? Where it's not like, oh, I can go do this in my weird hours. So people would be like, oh, so when you were working at Applebee's, did you go to the farmer's market in Brooklyn? And I'm like, well, I worked on Saturdays. Like, so no. But I would say, you know, most people, pretty much everybody likes really good fresh farm produce, right? It's just a question sometimes of cost and often of the convenience. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. So Artemis, do you need to say anything? Or? Okay. We have learned a lot. I apologize by saying there was a lot of food for thought tonight. I'm also going to say that we have a book signing, The American Way of Eating. Tracy will sign books and talk to you more. I think tonight really was an embodiment of what Ellen Catherine Gestalter might very well have appreciated herself. So please thank me, first of all, again, in thanking Tracy McMillan and thanking the Gestalter family for bringing us out of this. Thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed the evening.